Hello you, it's me, and the book we're going to be talking about this time is The Fellowship of the Ring, the first volume in the Lord of the Rings series by J.R.R. Tolkien. I was really excited about this. Having gotten a bit more into fantasy this year with the Cosmic Crab Along, I felt like this is something I should really tackle because I haven't read it before. So I will not have the nostalgia of me having read it as a kid affecting this review. And honestly, going into this book, I didn't know what to expect. I was really interested to see how it compared to the image of the books I had in my head and the reasons I'd put it off for so long, how it would compare to the movie. I'll give a plot rundown, then get straight to the review. I'll keep things I didn't like till right at the end. Uh, everything's going to be marked on the time bar, so if you want to skip, skip. There weren't many things I didn't like. I'll say that now. I enjoyed this book. But this review will contain many, many spoilers. It's an old book. Most of you have probably seen the movie. Most of you have probably even read this book if you're watching this review. So I don't think anybody is going to bite my head off for spoilering. Set many years after the adventures of The Hobbit, Bilbo Baggins is getting old, tiring of Hobbit and tiring of the Shire, and leaving to travel the world again, bequeaths to his nephew and heir Frodo Baggins the ring he stole from Gollum in the caves far beneath the Misty Mountains. His old friend, the wizard Gandalf, is curious about the extended life, the slow aging effects the ring seems to have had on Bilbo, and suspicious, goes off to find more about it. He finds out that it was a ring forged by the Dark Lord Sauron, ages and ages ago into which he poured his power, his malice. It's a weapon used to subjugate and control the other races of Middle-earth. Lately too, the power of Sauron is growing. He's rising from obscurity, pulling himself back from the brink of defeat, gaining power, gaining allies and followers, and is hell-bent on searching for the ring that will guarantee his victory. Frodo and a small company of Hobbit friends take the ring to Rivendell, a hidden elf city, to attend a council of representatives of the free races of Middle-earth, to piece together a plan to beat back the darkness, to destroy the ring to topple the growing armies of Mordor and restore peace. A fellowship is formed. Four hobbits, the wizard Gandalf, the ranger and should-be king Aragorn, Boromir of the White City of Gondor, Gimli the Dwarf, Legolas the Elf, and they set out on the long trek to Mordor and Mount Doom to cast the ring into the fire that forged it and undo its evil. So before I get into my feelings with this book, I do want to say I was a bit intimidated thinking about filming this review. I think in my head there's a lot of pressure when I review something to try and say something original, to have a new thought, to bring something else to the table. But with something like this, with such a die-hard fandom that's existed for almost a century now, it's going to be very difficult for me to pull this apart in a way it hasn't been pulled apart a million times before. This book has been skinned, turned inside out, shaken, and I have to keep saying to myself that all I can do is tell people about my personal experience. Which is what I guess all reviews should be, but I was thinking about it a bit more this time. Also, it's a bit scary reviewing something where the fandom might come for me if I say something bad. There are some pretty militant fans of this series, which is scary and fantastic at the same time. The next thing I'm going to say, I don't want anybody to misinterpret as me saying I didn't like this book. Because I did. This applies to all classics and older books. I feel it is important to allow people to make the distinction between books that are historically important and books that are good. One does not mean the other automatically. Many historically important books, if you read them now, suck. It is rare that a book is both. But those books do exist. But just because a book was good, that doesn't automatically mean that it is good, that it has stayed good. I do see a lot of people who gatekeep classics based on their appreciation of them. There's quite a big, you didn't like this, let me tell you why you're wrong, attitude. And I do see that a little bit in the Lord of the Rings community. Not a criticism, just bear that in mind. I'm going to come back and talk about that a bit more at the end. This is an incredibly descriptive book. This is a book that contains a lot of trivia you might not be interested in unless you really care about the overall big Tolkien world build. If you're the kind of person who is constantly looking for context, you probably won't care that this book is very info dumpy, because it is. I didn't mind it, because for me, I was learning history, taking in things which were 
giving more context to the parts of the films that I enjoyed. But this is not a book you dive into for an action-packed adventure. This is a quest. You are on a quest with the Fellowship of the Ring. Tolkien has written about a journey, and he's taking you on a journey, describing to you everything you see on that journey. So I think the enjoyment of this book really comes with a sit-back-and-enjoy-the-ride attitude. I think you can probably infer a lot about Tolkien from that, that he's a person that maybe appreciates the road to a place more than the place itself. In terms of info dump and context, I think you will appreciate this book more if you're the curious type, if you can look stuff up, either on the Lord of the Rings Wikipedia or referring to the appendices at the end of Return of the King, which are pretty beefy and do contain oodles of extra information. But I do wonder, is it possible to enjoy and appreciate Tolkien's work in isolation? Or do you have to take in every piece of it with the knowledge that it's part of a larger whole? Thoughts in the comments? Since I love the film so much, uh, they're probably the best fantasy films ever made, I'm going to be making a lot of comparison to the movies through this review. How I feel they differ, how I feel things could have been done differently maybe. But I think the biggest difference for me, the thing that really jumped out, was the tone difference. The book is a lot more light-hearted, and I don't know if it's because we don't have the graphic visuals, the battles, the conflicts, which in the book are sort of two lines then gone, or whether the book is actually more humorous, or whether the light-hearted feeling comes from spending so much time with characters in a very comfortable setting before the conflict even begins. About a third of this book, you're just relaxing with hobbits. But even the way the characters act seems so much less serious in the book. One example that really stuck with me uh, was the bit in the movie where you get that zoom in on Frodo and the compression of the Holloway. And he's like, get off the road! Get off the road! In the book, what happens is they hear a horse and they're all like, let's hide. And if it's Gandalf, we can jump out and scare him. I was surprised, though, genuinely how many lines made it from the book to the movie completely unchanged. The quotes which I had assumed were reworked to be more Hollywood were actually just taken word for word from the book. And seeing those gave me an appreciation for how Tolkien writes and the fact that even if he couldn't get across the grandeur of a scene on paper, he certainly had these intense emotional moments playing out in his head. He had a vision. So a lot of the criticism I hear about the movie in relation to the book is how much stuff was left out. And honestly, I was surprised a lot of stuff was left out. There's such a focus on the Shire, a focus on Hobbit life to get you attached to the main characters. And the pacing of the film is very different. But I think personally, that's because Tolkien intends for Lord of the Rings to be treated as one work rather than three separate books. If you look at the time spent in the Shire, in relation to book one, yeah, it seems excessive, but if you look at the focus on the Shire as opposed to the focus on the other places in Middle-earth throughout the trilogy, it's pretty reasonable. There are some things where I was like, okay, I can understand why they cut this. The one I hear most people talk about is Tom Bombadil, how he's such a weird character. But firstly, I get why he's in the book. He has the relationship with the world everybody wishes they have. He is the ideal. He's the master of his domain. And he exists as a reminder to the Hobbits that there are things out there that are way more powerful, way more strange than they could have previously imagined. I don't think there would have been a way to put him in the film and make him fit the tone of the film without changing the essence of his character. I also get why they left out the whites on the Barrow Downs, because they wanted the drama of Weathertop being the first conflict. They wanted that to be the moment where Frodo realises he is in over his head. And I think if you had had him face the undead, literally un zombies, before that point, it would have totally diminished the insane impact that the Weathertop fight had. There was one thing I really disagree with them having cut, and I think to a lot of people it's going to seem like a very minor thing, and it's Frodo's dream sequences, the almost vision-like, almost prophetic, metaphor-rich, foreshadowing of things to come and I really think Peter Jackson could have done those artfully and beautifully and they would have enriched the film. The last thing I'll say on the note of bits left out is if any of you haven't played Fellowship of the Ring on PS2, play it. 
it is literally a perfect chapter for chapter adaptation of this book which honestly is super weird because it came out one year after the movie it has the shire the old forest old man willow tom bombadil the whites the barrow downs everything it's a lord of the rings game based on the book and honestly it's tragic that it never got a proper sequel the other ps2 lord of the rings games were very much movie adaptations even had movie cutscenes. One thing that I think was really interesting in this book is there is a lot of hinting at a higher power for good being at play. And there wasn't really any of that in the movie. I know that Tolkien was a devout Roman Catholic, so maybe it's his religious nature shining through into his work. The coincidences that happen, how wild and essential they are, are acknowledged as being that. The most bonkers and obvious one was that in the movie, Elrond has summoned a council to discuss the ring, to discuss a plan, which he knew Frodo was bringing, so he called everybody in advance. In the book, everybody just happens to magically turn up on the same day. They all come to Rivendell for very different, very personal reasons, and just coincidentally happen to arrive at the same time. You have the main party with Aragorn and hobbits. You have Legolas, who has come, I think, because they were tracking Gollum, who escaped. You have Gimli and his dad, who are there because they're there to ask help from the elves because a bunch of dwarves have gone to Moria to try and retake it, to cut a path through it, and they've not been heard from since. Then at the last minute you have Boromir rock up, who's come to ask for elf help for Gondor, and he didn't know where Rivendell was, so he's literally been walking around the countryside looking for it for 110 days. That whole bit was super weird. Another thing that was really strange to me reading this was how little internal monologue you get for any character. You have Frodo's dream sequences, yes. You have his thoughts maybe twice. You have Gandalf's internal monologue once. And it's so weird and out of place that it sticks out really badly. It makes the book read very much like a film because you are a visual observer. You don't get that insight into the characters at all. You're a fly on the wall. Something else that did stick out to me in this book was the lack of female characters, except for Galadriel, who was fantastic. I know that Arwen is going to get fleshed out down the line, that Eowyn is going to be introduced in book two, so I'm not going to comment on female representation yet. I'm going to do that in my review of the third book once I have the bigger picture. I've read whole articles and essays while I was scripting this review, talking about female representation in Tolkien's work. There are some really interesting opinions out there that are totally different from each other, so I highly recommend a Google. Okay, so, the main themes of Lord of the Rings, Fellowship of the Ring. With the emphasis for so much of this book being on the Shire, I think there's a big theme of normal, everyday people being sucked into a conflict without having a choice. I think there's the theme of war, of legions of enemies arising, of lands being put to the torch, people killed, all stemming from the greed of one person. There's the theme of doing what's right and potentially difficult, and having to weigh that against doing something that is easy will guarantee your survival, but may not be morally correct, sort of embodied by the thing with Saruman. With the elves leaving Middle-earth to the Undying Lands, I think you also have this theme of the idea that if you even if you win a war, something is going to be lost and you will never get it back. Maybe innocence, maybe your ability to find beauty in the world once you've seen what people are capable of. One place I think this book really shines, uh, the message of this book, is that you have this brilliant idea of heroism and what that clearly means to Tolkien. It clearly means standing up for what's right, it clearly means putting other people before yourself. But it doesn't mean aggression. It never means conflict or winning through strength. The heroes of this book are the ones in the party who have the least ability to fight at all. And maybe the thing that wins is an idea and determination. This is the Stuff I Didn't Like section. If you don't want to hear things about your favourite ever series, skip to the next section. You will like that section much more. The thing I liked least in this book, the thing that really ticked me off, was characters saying... I'll tell you later. Somebody would ask something and the reply would be, I'll not speak of it here. Or, we'll talk about it when we get to X place. And it would be explained, kind of, way later. It's like, dude, my guy, tell me now. It'll take two minutes and you can talk while we're walking. I don't think it added anything to the book to delay stuff like that. 
besides making characters annoying. While I really enjoyed the poetry, the songs in this book, uh, there are many, 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 many songs in this book, I think the way they were introduced was bad. There's only one or two songs where I can believe the circumstances for it happening. Uh, one was the song in the tavern in Brie, because it's a tavern. People are drunk, they want to sing, they want to dance. But when they're all sitting around talking and one of the characters in the party just starts... It doesn't even say singing. He says that they're like chanting under their breath, quietly, almost at whisper level. And everyone else just stares at them patiently, waits for them to finish. And then they're like, wow, that was really good. I was like, hmm, every time that happened. And it happened a lot. I like Tolkien. I'm a bit salty about what came after him. I think I resent the ripples this series made. I think a lot of fantasy stuff to a fantasy outsider feels so heavily Tolkien inspired that it's too similar to be something original. I tried this book series before. I, I tried to read this years ago and didn't like it. And I think knowing or having the idea that so much stuff comes from this book, from this thing that I didn't like, was something that really pushed me away from high fantasy for a very long time. I have some other comments and questions. This is the bit where you can come for me if you want. Educate me. Tell me what's what. Some of this stuff I may have misunderstood. I just genuinely want to know the answers. Some of it's just comments, thoughts, random bits. Firstly, it's pretty wild that the Ringwraiths, before they're called Ringwraiths, just get called Black Chaps or Black Fellows. The innkeeper in Bree saying, rest assured, I will not let a black man cross the threshold. I know it doesn't mean that, but reading it's like, yikes. I really think they did dwarves dirty in the movies. In the book, you have dwarves at Bilbo's party, dwarves on the road, dwarves in the tavern at Bree and Rivendell. In the movie, you have Gimli. You have a couple of pals of his that were standing around at Elrond's. And I'm 99% sure after the first movie, you only ever see Gimli. He's the only dwarf in the next two films. In the book, you get a bit more context about why Moria is the way it is. I think I did need that. I was glad to see it. You have hints at history, but just through the occasional mention of Durin, who I'm guessing I won't know about until the appendices. And is that good storytelling? I don't know. We also know that dwarves have a secret word for Mithril uh, that they won't tell anybody else, but it never explains why. I know The Hobbit was very heavy in terms of dwarf characters. I haven't read that since I was a kid. I'd be interested to see how much dwarf lore is in that, if there's more than this. I'll have to have a reread. But I feel like Tolkien went so hard on his elf lore and hobbit lore. Maybe dwarves have sort of fallen by the wayside and been neglected a bit. Hopefully I'll be proved wrong and there'll be loads of cool dwarf stuff in the next two books. This next one's a question. In the poem, the famous poem, it's heavily implied that Sauron made all the rings with the skills he learnt from the elven smiths. But Elrond says he did not have a hand in making the three elf rings. They were never touched by Sauron at all. And that's why they remained uncorrupted. So did he make all the rings except the elf ones? Did he just make dwarf rings and human rings? Next question. Was Luthien the first elf to ever die? It mentions elves have been leaving to the Undying Land for yonks. But then it talks about Luthien giving up her immortality. And it says something like, And so it was that Luthien was the first of elf kind to die and pass from this world. Which sounds like, up until this point, elves had either gone to the Undying Land or faded away, and Luthien was the first elf to actually kick it. Or does it just mean that she died willingly of old age? It, I think usually Tolkien is very deliberate with word choice, but that one passage seems unclear. The magic system. The magic system is pretty much nonsense. At the start of this book, very early on, I had some questions. It says at Bilbo's party, the children are given toys of dwarven make that are magic. They are magical toys. And in a world where magic has been invested in things like toys, if it's that easy to do, why has it not been weaponized? I feel like in a world where you have entire races, entire cities twisted by greed, there would be people trying to use magic towards nefarious ends. In the movies, we see so little in the way of magic. Maybe it's like a budget thing, I don't know. In the books, we see a lot more. We see from a distance Gandalf fighting the Ringwraiths on Weathertop. We see him cast spells actually fairly frequently. But in the book, he mentions that he knows every spell, he says, I know every spell in the tongues of 
Men, elf, dwarves, and orcs. So dwarves and orcs have spells. They can do magic, or at some point could do magic. Or is he saying that he knows the same spell in four or five languages? And if that's the case, then what's the point? The way the elves describe magic is pretty funny. They say they don't understand magic, but are clearly using it. Galadriel gives them cloaks, and Sam asks if they're magic cloaks. And she's like, mm, I don't know what you mean by magic, but these will keep you hidden and turn people's eyes away. Also, here's a scabbard uh, that will make unbreakable any sword you ever pull out of it. This is the randomest, softest magic system ever, which had me thinking, what was the first hard magic system? If you have any ideas, chuck it in the comments. I'm interested. Last question, I promise. Are orcs and goblins the same? In the book and on the Lord of the Rings Wikipedia, it says yes, that they're different terms for the same thing in different languages, that goblin is a hobbit term for orc. But in the movies, especially The Hobbit, in all adaptations of The Hobbit, even the animated ones, they're very much implied to be different species. So what's the truth, nerds? So I did enjoy this book. I have a lot of questions. I hope it's going to be richer when I look at it as part of the whole, when I'm finished. I'm going to give this one three stars, but that might change. So hold your horses. So thanks very much for watching. Uh, if you like sci-fi stuff don't forget to join our interstellar book club which i'll link the discord for down below don't forget to follow me on twitter and goodreads which i'll also link down below don't forget to like and subscribe and say hi in the comments i'll see you next time for the next review bye